You know, once a quarter, we try to do a, a family service where kids are in with their parents. We think it's an important thing that they worship together. It also gives the kids' ministry a, a chance to have a, a little break for a week. But uh, mostly we do it as a value that uh, kids spend time worshiping with their parents, families together. So how are you guys doing? Good, good. good. I'm doing good. I'm, I'm the titanium man, you know. I have six stents on this side, two on this side in, in July, and I'm rocking and rolling, I'm exercising, so how many stints do you have? Okay, then, good. I beat you all. <laughs> I'm so competitive. All right, well, today, um, we're, we're talking about Ephesians chapter 2. We're in the book of Ephesians, and we're going starting the, the second chapter. We just uh, spent four weeks in the first chapter. And uh, Ephesians is an important book for us to understand our relationship with God and our relationship as a church to the world. Because the church of Christ is essential in reaching the world. We are His body, and we'll talk a little more about that. But why don't we just pray and invite the Holy Spirit to come, all right? Why don't you join me? Lord, we love you. We thank you for your goodness. And right now, we just invite your Holy Spirit to be with us. Lord, would you open our ears? There is a way to hear where we're changed. And there's a way to hear where we just nod our heads. And uh, we bo- all know it. And, and so, Lord, we, we want to be changed by you today. Do you guys agree? We want to be changed by your spirit today. As we talk about a reality check, Lord, we pray that you would just speak to each person. Open up our hearts, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we're going we're gonna to read this portion of Scripture, and why don't we read it together? I'll put it up in, or, yeah, I'll put it up. There it is. Um, we're, we're starting at the end of chapter 1, and the reason why is because there were no chapters and verses when it was written, and uh, actually chapter 2 relates to chapter 1. Isn't that amazing? And uh, it's actually talking about the people of chapter 1, and so uh, we, want to, we want to understand the connection. So I thought we'd just go back just a little bit, a li- one verse uh, so we didn't go too far back and kind of catch it. So can we all read this aloud together? We're just so good at this, right? And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of our body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind, but God. <laughs> I just left it like that because you'll see we're, we're doing a reality check today, and it's kind of our real situation. And uh, without Christ, our real situation is not very good, is it? The Bible is very clear that without Christ, we do not have hope in this world. And so I just needed to put that but God in there because that's the next part we're going to talk about next week. But we can't leave ourselves realizing just where we're at right now. We have got to grab hold of the grace that God has for us as well. So it is going to be um, probably... uh, um, kind of a serious talk, and that's kind of unfortunate that all the kids are here for it, but we have candy. We have candy. (laughs) All right. We're going to do a little competition in a little while. Well, you do have a good video too, so it should be fun. All right. So 
Last week, the last point Jody made was about the church. It was this very point that he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. What is the church? The church is the fullness of God that fills the earth with the glory of God. That's who we are supposed to be as a church. We're not just this group that gathers together on Sundays and does nice potlucks and does small groups. Those are good things. There's nothing wrong with any of that. We are the church of Christ, filling the world with the knowledge of God so that people can come to faith in Christ. It is much broader, much more powerful, much more profound than anything that we hear about the church. We give glory to God. Point to someone right now and say, we give glory to God. Some of you did that. Okay, we're going to get you guys yet. Don't worry. We give glory to God. That's what the church is all about. The church is his completeness and manifests Christ's Christ's presence in the world. We are the ones charged with that. Not just the pastors. Not just some advertisement or some little tract or some evangelist that's out there. The church of God is to give glory to God. And in order for us to do it, we really have to have this reality check. That's why Paul put this right next to this understanding of what the church is. Now, you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. Each one of you is a part of the body of Christ. Did you know that? Did you know that you're not just an individual Christian that is trying to make it through each week, that is trying to figure out things, trying to save a little money away, trying to get your car fixed, trying to get the family in order, trying all these things? You are the body of Christ. Understanding that is important. And that's why we're doing this book of Ephesians. Ephesians is about God revealing mysteries. And one of the greatest mysteries there is in the book of Ephesians, mysteries being that it was hidden and now it's revealed. And the revelation is the church of God is his body that is reaching the world to the glory of God. That's who we are. How many of you accept that as part of your job description? The rest of you, what are you doing? (laughs) You know, when you think about the church and you think about how the church over history gave glory to God from like the beginning, its inception until until now. You can look at, I just picked one example, one teeny example. In 256, there was a plague in Alexandria. Everyone fled, but the Christians were there. They ministered, they served, they risked their own lives because they would have died or could have died. They risked their own lives to care for those that were sick when everyone else fled. Matter of fact, the emperor was so impressed with it that he tried to kind of instill this in like a welfare system within within the state, but it didn't work because Christians did it out of love. And the state did it out of mandate. And that doesn't work, does it? At the risk of their own lives, they saved an amazing amount of lives. That's the church of Christ. That's to the glory of God. That's carrying your cross daily. And people looking and saying, that is different. I've never seen anything like it. Why would they do that? And now we look at at something present, and it was on the screen just a minute ago. Why, why would anyone go from first world experience to a third world country? When Kevin went two years ago, he was sick for almost a year because of the transition. It's, It's a definitely different environment. The Philippines is very poor. And what did he do? The first thing that God led him to do was to go to the poorest of the poor. No one went there. Not even the church that was in the Philippines would go there. They were the untouchables. No, we 
we don't know what to do with them, and so we are going to kind of leave them on their own, let them have their own experience, and we are not going to reach them. But Kevin decided, because the Lord told him to, he thought, I better obey God. That's a good idea. How many think that's a good idea? He went and he obeyed God, and guess what? For the first time in over 10 years, for 10 years, the church in the Philippines has been praying that there would be a church in that region that was a living church, that was a vibrant church, and now there is. And now not just one, but five churches. Why? Because the church of Jesus Christ is this, giving glory to God. Why would he do that? Why would Kevin do that? Why would he risk his life risk his reputation, and do what no one else would do. And then, of course, he went into the prison and did the same thing. And now there's five churches and a Bible school, people baptized, lives are being changed because the church is alive and the church is what the church should be. That's the church. Isn't that exciting? That's who we are. We're the church. Thank you, family of Kevin. If you ever want applause when you're up here, just mention something about Kevin and how good he's doing, and those guys will clap for you. <laughs> I bring this context for a reason. It's not just context. The reality is, is this church that Paul is talking about that is the fullness of him who fills all in all. That's gigantic phrases, you guys. The vision of those words is that this is it. We are the revelation of God, filled with the Spirit of God to the rest of the world. That's who we are. We are a city on a hill. We're not some political organization. We are to the glory of God. We're not some helps organization. We can do that. We can do that. That's fine. But we are to the glory of God. And people look and they say, oh, that's what Jesus looks like. And that's why Paul thinks it's important to have a reality check. Because if we are to be the fullness of him who fills all in all, we need to really know how we started. How we started. So we're going to do a reality check. You have to understand that there was not even a period in between chapter 1 and, and uh, verse 22 talking about the church and this next part and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. That's exactly, exactly what Paul is saying. You are the church of God, the fullness of him who fills all in all, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Whoa, that's amazing, isn't it? That's what gives glory to God. Dead people living. Dead people living. And who are the you? The you here is the church. You were dead. You were dead. What is dead? What is dead? Well, if you look at the defin where it first started, it started in Genesis, right? And so we have the scripture up there. It says, And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from the tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely what? Die. die. That's where death is talked about first. You will die. Dead is real. Dead is very real. You know, there's a, a little girl that uh, is a relative of someone that goes to our church, a niece of someone who goes to our church who is in IMC right now in, in the critical care unit, uh, head trauma, because she got hit by a car. Her and a friend were walking across the street, got hit by a car, and now her brain has a traumatic injury. And you know that dead is dead when you look into the eyes of a parent or a loved one who is worrying about their relative like that. You know that there is something very serious. Dead isn't just sleeping. Dead is dead. It's a serious thing. I just think we should pray for her. What do you think? Her name is Brielle. Lord, we just lift up Brielle to you. Do you guys agree? 
We lift her up in the name of Jesus. We pray for the miraculous to happen. We thank you that you are the God of the miraculous and that you would heal her brain, heal her body, and restore her health. And not only that, Lord, we pray that you would save her and her entire family, that they would come to know you as Lord and Savior, that they would be forever forgiven of their sins and walk from death to life as we talk about today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 They'll be glad to know that we prayed for them today. So, dead is real. And it, it says along in the same passage in, in, in Genesis, then the eyes, after they had eaten from the fruit that they shouldn't eat, the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized that they were naked. Naked is code word for dead. Did you know that? It's code for dead. They were dead. The eyes of both of them were open and they realized they were dead. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. They realized, they realized their whole reality had changed. Now they weren't physically dead, but it was a reality. We don't understand this because we were born dead. We'll talk more about that in a minute. But they were not born dead. They were born spiritually alive in direct connection to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And at that very moment when they ate that fruit, they were dead. And that relationship stopped. And they realized it. It was as real as real could be. When we say that word dead, they were dead. And that's why God used it. That's why Paul uses this word. God realized. He said, where are you? Why did he say, where are you? Did he not know where they were? Do you think God did not know where they were? Of course he did. He was saying, what happened to our relationship? What happened to the life that I was pouring into you that now no longer is pouring into you? Where did it go? Where are you? And you know what? God is crying out to people all over this world, through us, the church. He's saying, where are you? Where are you? Do you think God is passive and he has no desire to have people come to faith in Christ and saved? Of course not. The cross is the great evidence of that. He is crying to people all over this world, where are you? I want to fill you with my life again. Amen. Paul uses this example of dead because there is no middle ground. A person is either dead or he is alive. There is no middle ground. Only in the princess bride is there middle ground <laughs> where someone is mostly dead. You guys know that movie? I love that movie. <laughs> that character is great. <laughs> there is no middle ground. You're either alive or you're dead. Just as a dead body, physical body, cannot respond to stimulus, a dead spiritual soul cannot respond to the Spirit of God. Cannot. Lifeless, powerless, unable to respond, spiritual death. Lazarus is a good example of this. Lazarus could not raise himself from the dead. Christ Jesus himself called to Lazarus and said, rise. And because of God's sheer desire, the word of God spoken, Lazarus rose. It had nothing to do with him. There was nothing he could do. He was dead. He wasn't partially dead. He wasn't mostly dead. He wasn't three quarters dead. He was fully dead for days. And he stunk. Thank you. <laughs> That's what they said. And Jesus Christ, in his own power, by his own grace, rose Lazarus from the grave. That is who we are, spiritually speaking. We are dead, dead. Isn't this encouraging? 
<laughs> the kids' ministry, you know, they put together all kinds of goodies for the kids to draw on and stuff like that. And, and they asked, so what's the topic of your sermon so that we can, like, do appropriate things for them? And they heard what it was, and they walked away scratching their heads. <laughs> what are we going to do? <laughs> Don't worry. I have candy. <laughs> candy. Kids, you got candy coming. This is what Dallas Willard said, okay? The light bulb is dead when disconnected from the electrical current, even though it still exists. But when connected to the current, it radiates and affects in surroundings with a power and substance that is in it, but not of it. Isn't that a good example of spiritual death? We have physical bodies. We are here, but we do not have the life of Christ. So, what causes death? Sin is evil that causes death. Sin is evil that causes death. Trespasses and sins, it talks about in our scripture. The Greek word here describes both two things. One, that sin is the cause of death. And it is also the evidence of death. It is the stink of death, like Lazarus. It is both. So first, it causes death. I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. Adam knew that he was dead, that something radical had happened, and there was no longer any relationship between God and him. It was not there anymore. They could have a conversation, as they did, but there was no intimacy of relationship anymore. We can only imagine what that's like. In heaven, we will have that and even more. But even now, we are just practicing for what God has. Aren't you excited? It's going to be awesome. Sin is the evil that causes death. That word hamartia in the Greek it, it means to miss the mark. We are called to hit the mark, hit the bullseye every time because God's standard is perfection. He is holy. There is nothing in him that is not holy. And Adam and Eve, they could have walked in that holiness had they chosen to, but they didn't. And because of that, we all now face the fact that we will miss the mark many times a day. A lot of people in my life say I miss even more. <laughs> we miss the mark all the time. And then the scripture in Romans 6 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ. Sin is evil that causes death. The wages of sin, the payment for sin in our lives. It's like, okay, you've sinned, and now, okay, give me my payment. And what is it? It's death. It's death. That's what we receive. Thanks a lot. Do I at least get unemployment insurance? The wages of sin is death. Now, after sin causes death... It now does something to us, and it does something to all of us. And that is, as we start following the leader. Who's the leader? The leader is the one who leads this entire world. Oops, almost. <laughs> the one who has been released to lead this whole world is the devil. God has allowed him to run this place. So sin is also evil that is evidence of our death. And now we start following the leader in the things that he does, in the systems that he's put in place, and we start living that life. And we see that all over the place. Just read the scripture again just so that we can have the context on the emphasis on these areas. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. 
First of all, I just want to give you some encouragement. Paul is saying, you once walked and you once lived. Aren't you glad that this is something that once the cross of Christ, once the grace of God has been applied to your soul, that this is something that's in the past? Isn't that amazing? It is. There's nothing more wonderful than realizing that that is the way you were. I once was blind, but now I see. There's nothing like it. And that's my point for today. We have to get this before we have a full understanding and appreciation of grace. So we have to have this reality check. We have to have this reality check if we're going to be the church of God, the way God has called us to be the church of God. We have to have it. And that's why Paul put it right here at the beginning. At the beginning. So first, we're following. Following the course of this world. What does that look like? Ephesians 4 says, You were taught with regard to the former ways of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. There is a corruption that's taking place. It is deceitful desires that are, that are expressing themselves in our lives. We are doing what we want, what we need. Me, me, me. Exactly what Adam and Eve did. They hid. They hid from the life that they could have because they were afraid. And so we are constantly, without the grace of God, we are constantly going towards our needs and trying to get them filled. This old self that we have is something that we can put off now, Paul is talking about. Later on, we'll get to it in Ephesians 4. But we can put off this old self. Why? Because it has no power over us anymore. Amen? Because of the grace of God. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. There is a pattern in this world. Have you seen it? It's a pattern of fear, intimidation, pride, power. This is the pattern of this world. We all walk on in it. Some of us are louder than others, but we all walk in it. This pattern of this world. But we do not have to conform any longer to it. Hallelujah. We're not just following the course of this world. We are also following the prince of the power of the air. Who's that? Who said that? Satan. Oh, okay, good. That's right. Oh, you're right. I'm kidding. I was just, if it was a kid, I was going to throw him some candy. <laughs> you're not a kid. Oops, sorry. <laughs> it says of Satan, Satan, the god of this evil world. Is that up there? Because last, last time it wasn't. Nope. Let's see if we have it. Yeah, there we go. Satan, the god of this evil world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe, so they are unable to see the glorious light of the good news that is shining upon them. The devil has blinded our eyes, and we are following this prince of the power of the air. And then it also says, we know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. Did you know that? Did you know that this world is under his control for a time? It's not like God doesn't have control. God gave him control for a time. But we must know that because the systems and the ways of thinking and the ways of acting and the aspirations of this world are all developed by him for the purpose, the sole purpose, to steal, kill, and destroy. That's all he cares about is stealing your life killing your life, and destroying your soul. You think that's a little phrase. It's in the Bible, so it's a nice phrase, but it's reality. You have an enemy, and he is the prince of the power of the air. And until you know Christ, you are following him whether you think you are or not. Because there is no other, it is a power that is greater than you. 
but it is not a power that is greater than God. Living in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of body and mind. Do we not see that in the world today? That people are carrying out the desires of their bodies and their minds. Whatever they think, they try to do. Whatever satisfies their, their body in any way, that is what we see. It even becomes law in many ways. Even in our country. To satisfy the body. This is following the prince of the power of the air. This is our situation, aren't you glad? Before Christ. It's important to know this. I am so excited to share this with you. I know you think I'm crazy. <laughs> but the most amazing thing is that this is what we were. But God, but God in his grace and love has given us the grace of his son. Amen? Amen. So we see this evidence of death instantly in Genesis and constantly throughout history. It says in Genesis, the Lord God called to the man, where are you? And he answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. This is the style of life we all live, whether we recognize it or not. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I've commanded you not to eat? And the man said, the woman who put, he, put, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit and ate it, and I ate it. And then the Lord God said to the woman, what is it you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. There's a few things were happening here in the scripture. First of all, there was fear. They were hiding. This is a world that is full of fear. Some of the people that show their power the most are the most afraid. Because if they think they could exert power, they can protect themselves, but they cannot. Fear is rampant in this world. Guilt, nakedness, feeling guilty, trying to, trying to cover up, trying to be a good person. I'm a good person trying to meet people's expectations. And, and my goodness, I've never seen a state where more people try to look good in front of others. I have never seen a state like it in my life. It's shocking. It happens everywhere. But honestly, it, it's very rampant in our state that people must look good. They must have the right car. They must have the right house. They must have the right spouse. And if your spouse isn't right, get them corrected with surgery, you know, a little cosmetic surgery and stuff. Whatever it takes in order to look good. Denial, hiding, blame, blaming the woman, blaming God. Whatever you can blame, it's their fault. It's my fault. I'm the victim. That victim mentality is something that is rampant in our society as well. Don't you agree? And now we have to look at the fact that not only are we dead, but we are controlled by that death, and we are in big trouble. Big trouble. Because the scripture says that we're by nature children of wrath. We are by nature children of wrath. That means that it's not just, well, I kind of blew it. And, you know, I have some issues. It's not that. It's so much more than that. Our nature is a nature that causes us to be children of wrath, that causes us to be punished because of our sin. It is our sin nature. We were born like that. In a world that thinks that everyone is good, God is saying that I love you, but you must know that you desperately need to be saved because you are dead. Dead. By nature. You know, I just look at innocent kids. Yesterday, we were, we were um, in the park walking around, and there was a dad who had a one-year-old. 
and he was in the stroller. We had our dog. They had their dog, and it was fun, and the kid is so stinking cute, you know? He's just looking up at me with that face and smiling at me, and I'm smiling back, thinking I'm making such a difference in this little kid's life, and I did and he pets the dog and everything, you know, it's so cute, so cute, and just give him another eight months, and he turns two years old, and he becomes the terrible two monster. <laughs> it's true, right? You start seeing the sin nature come out so early. What we're talking about is evidenced in children, even at a young age. Kids, who has seen that in their life? You have? Okay, here you go. Ready? There you go. <laughs> he admitted it. That's good. Remember that, parents. He admitted it, right? You can't just get away with that now. <laughs> Can't you say the woman made me do it now? <laughs> All right, so at this point now, we realize that it's our nature, but Paul does something important here, and that is he's changing it to you. You were dead in your trust, transgressions and sins. He now changes it to we. We are children of wrath. He's saying that there is no one that is not under this curse. Everyone, including himself, is under the curse of the wrath of God. Yay! <laughs> God's wrath is his holy hatred of sin and everything evil. And we are children of wrath before we know Christ. This scripture is so amazing. All of us have become like one who is unclean. And all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf. And like the wind, our sins sweep us away. Sweep us away. We don't have any control over this. Our sins sweep us away. Like on, on one of those fall days when there's a million bazillion leaves on the floor and they're all dead and they're totally useless. There's no life in them. They're brown and crisp and brittle and dry and the wind comes and... <sighs> That's the sin nature. We are children of wrath. And the scripture declares in Galatians that the whole world is prisoner to sin. The whole world outside of Christ is prisoners to sin. You have to know, if you're born in the church, if you grew up in the church, it is very easy not to get this because you grew up in an environment where Christ was there. You, you know, I'm sure it wasn't perfect because there is no perfect church, right? Right? We're the only perfect church. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> there is no perfect church. Just get over it. This is a total side note. I'm surprised I'm saying this. You have to know something. If you're looking for a church or if you're here and you see something that's imperfect, good. Good. Because guess what? You're probably here to help us. So get to work. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm serious. We will never be a perfect church. Church is not a destination. It is a drive. We are driving together and seeing the glory of God happen. We are not looking for some perfection down here. Okay, we finally arrived. We will never arrive. Just get over it. Don't ever think we will get there. We need everyone here to be doing their work and to be doing what God has called them to do to the glory of God. Amen? Amen? That has nothing to do with what I'm talking about. prisoners of sin. So we come to this point and we, and we realize, wow, we are, we are dead and we are controlled by this terrible system of death that the devil, who is more powerful than us, has power over. But God, but God who is rich in mercy, that's all I'm giving you. You come back next week. You have to hear it. The important thing is, though, is that you have to hear this first, that we are hopeless without Christ. Paul is saying this on purpose, because if you are to be a Christian that has any ability to do anything eternal, 
if we are going to be a church that has any ability to do anything to reach the world for Christ, then we have to get this in our souls, that we were hopeless without God. And there's a lot of churches and a lot of people that think they got this, but I'm telling you, you have to remember it. You have to remember this. You have to remember, but for the grace of God go I. Because if not, you become a hypocrite. You become judgmental. Is this not some of the things the church has been called throughout the ages? And guess what? They're probably right. I'm sorry to say. But we choose not to be that. Adventure Church, we do not want to be a church of hypocrites. We will say, I did it. I am a sinner and I am saved by grace. And no one will call us a hypocrite because we already gave them all the ammunition. <laughs> there is no ammunition left. <laughs> right? This is the greatest news that we were dead. This is the beginning of the gospel. If you don't have this, you don't have the gospel. You have to know that you're dead in order to appreciate becoming alive. Amen. And you have to know it every day. You don't, have to, you don't want to know death every day, but you want to remember where you came from and how hopeless it was. And so we must surrender. We must surrender. The beginning of the gospel is understanding our dead state. And we can surrender to grace. We can surrender. We do not have to make excuses. We do not have to have fig leaves. We do not have to hide. There is no reason. This is the best news in the world, you guys. We do not have to hide from God. Amen. The whole world sees God as the judge. And we are his children, and we can come and sit on his lap. There is nothing like it, you guys. There is nothing like knowing that we are safe in the arms of God. Nothing. Why does Paul think this is so important to tell us? Because it's hard to get. We grew up like this. We grew up being afraid. Even if you grew up in a Christian home, this, this is a reality for you. This fear, this sin nature, until you came to Christ. And even then, you, you still hold on to the lies, right? We have to deal with them. Lou Giglio says this, You can't have the living water until you're honest with yourself that you're dying without it. So you have to get this first part. You have to get this first part. You know, I, I just think about my heart, and I think about the diagnosis that I got, that I have 100% blockage on this side. I had, and I had 95% blockage on this side. There's only other one other side, and that's the middle. And that was okay, thank goodness. Otherwise, I'd be dead now. For the grace of God, I'm here. And I had no idea. I was clueless. This was just this month, you guys. This was just this month. I was clueless. This is what we have to get. We were dead. We were dead. But God made us alive. When I realized my diagnosis, everything changed. Everything changed. Everything had greater meaning. Couldn't break a sweat until after the surgery. <laughs> All kinds of crazy things. We have to realize how bad we are off before we can realize how great God's gift is. But if you're in denial, if you think, no, I'm a good person, I think I could do it on my own. You know how many people say that? Almost everybody. I think I could do it on my own. I've certainly said it many times. I've seen family members say it. I've seen friends say it. I've seen people in our church say it. I think I could do this on my own. I'm going to do this life on my own. And just deny the reality that you're dead. 
It just doesn't make sense. It's kind of insane. It really is. We, we think it's okay. You know, I can manage this. I can look cool. It's okay. I'll make this through this life. It's just a flesh wound. It isn't, is it? Well, that guy, he could at least talk. Right? He could yell at him and say, I'll bite you. <laughs> oh, I love that little thing. How many of you are mad I showed that? No? Okay, good. You know, I'm not making this political at all, but I do want to talk about something in politics that has been brought up, and, and that is something that one of the politicians said. They said, I, can, I fully think apologizing is a great thing, but you have to be wrong first. And basically what was being said there is that doesn't happen very often. And I'll tell you, that is the way of the world. That's the way of the world. To be thinking that you haven't sinned every day is insanity. It's a lack of clarity. It's denial. I did it. Can you say it? Raise your hand and say, I did it. I, did it. I sinned. I was wrong. This is a good thing. <clears throat> you know, the reality is, is that most people, they'll say anything besides, I sinned, I was wrong. There's all kinds of creative things you can say. Right? Besides, I sinned, I was wrong. What? He deserved, it. he deserved it. Oh, yeah. Well, that's making an excuse, right? There's all kinds of creative things you can say. But you know what? It is really good for us to say, I sinned, I was wrong. We need to surrender. We need to surrender to God. No excuses, no ifs, ands, or buts. What is your fig leaf of operation? What do you use in your life? What do you try to cover up what you've done? We all have it. It's okay to expose it and to say, this is wrong. I do not have to live like this anymore. I just want to close with this story. Jesus went to a house of some Pharisees some leaders of the law. And there was a woman who came to Jesus and she was weeping and she had this anointing oil, this perfume. And she wept and she wept and she wept. And her tears were wetting the feet of Jesus. And she poured this perfume on Jesus' feet and used her hair to wipe his feet. And the Pharisees the ones who were trying to look good said, and they, they looked at Jesus and said, doesn't he get it? He's a prophet and he doesn't know who is washing his feet. And of course, Jesus knew exactly who was washing his feet. And so he decided to tell a parable. Love these parables that Jesus tells. He tells a parable of two people who owed their master money, one 500 denarii, one 50 denarii. And they had no way of paying it back. No way. You ever fall into that condition? We fall in that condition every day, realizing we have no way to pay back God for the sin that we have committed. There is no way. The wages of sin is death. There is nothing we can do to pay God back to get him back on our side. There was only one thing that he did, and that was die on the cross for our sins so that we could be, he could be on our side once again. They couldn't pay him back. And so the master forgave both of them, and the object of the parable was this. Jesus said, who loved the master more? And of course, the answer is what? the one who was forgiven more. The one who was forgiven more. And then, this is the, the end of the story. Then he turned towards the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I came into the house. You did not give me water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. 
You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who has been forgiven little loves little. What's the point here? Recognize how much trouble you have been in in your life. Recognize it. You were dead in your transgressions and sins. You might be here today and you don't know Jesus. You are hearing this for the first time maybe, that you are dead spiritually and God wants to make you alive by the power of his Holy Spirit. Those of you that are a part of our church or a part of the church, know this, that woman's response is the response that makes the church the church. Lavish love out of a response to realizing that there is no way, no way, no way that she could have paid that back. What was the gift that was given to her? And we have that too. It is very easy in the church to forget this and to think, okay, I know this because I've done it and I do it on a regular basis. I'm doing pretty good. I'm doing pretty good. I know Jesus died for me, but I'm doing pretty good now. The reason why Paul put this here at the beginning of his understanding of the church and how it was going to be revealed to the world and change the world was this, that we have to get this and we have to remember it daily so that we love the way she loved. As individuals, what is an individual who surrenders to God's great grace behaves, behaves with this love, this lavish love? What does a church look like that is like this? I'll tell you, a church like this is a church that sends its best to go to the Philippines to to do something miraculous. A church that loves like this is a church that sends its best to go on every other Friday to feed the homeless and share the gospel and pray for them and love them or do Jesus feeds or the many other things that happens here and at other churches. It's not just us. But church... Adventure Church. We are called to be this church. Amen? And that means we're forgetting about pettiness. We are forgetting about gossip. We are forgetting about our point of view being more important than someone others, some others. We are forgetting about politics. We are forgetting about all of this because there's nothing more important than loving God the way this woman loved God and expressing that in the world. Who gives a rip about the things that are really peripheral issues? Amen? Who cares when people are dying in this world, the death that we just talked about? Who cares? And so let us live a life of love as a church. Let us, it says that love overlooks wrongs. Let us overlook wrongs. Let us not be a church that, it, that gets its toes stepped on and then it takes days, hours, months, years to resolve the issues. Amen? Let's forgive right there because we've been forgiven. Amen? This is the church that's going to change the world. This is the church that God is calling us to be, Adventure Church. This is the church. Amen? I want you to stand with me. We're going to close. I just want to invite you to surrender again to the Lord. Just close your eyes and maybe maybe lift your hands as a sign of surrender right now. Surrender to Him. You never have to make an excuse again. You never have to worry again. You never have to fear God again because you are saying, I did it, I was wrong. I have sinned and I have fallen short of the glory of God. But God loved me and he sent his only son and forgave me. And as that woman at Jesus' feet, I am forever, forever 
worshiping you, Jesus, in love with you, Jesus. I will express my love to you like never before. Those of you that have been a part of the church for a long time, God wants to revive this in your heart. He wants to revive the lavish love that he has poured into your souls so that you are, you are not um, just satisfied with what God has for you, but you hunger and thirst after more of what he has. Receive what he has for you right now. Receive it in the name of Jesus. Oh, Lord, we love you. Can you just thank the Lord right now? Lord, I thank you. Lord, I thank you for dying on the cross for me. I thank you. I love you, Lord. God, I am such a sinner. I have sinned so many ways, God. I have invented new sins. It's been so bad. But God, you have saved me. You have set me free. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, I just want to give opportunity for anyone today who is hearing about this great gift of grace, but also hearing at the same time that we are dead without it, that there is no hope without it. And maybe, maybe you're hearing this for the first time. Maybe God is calling you and drawing you. Maybe you've been away from God and you, he's calling you back today. We want to give you that opportunity. While people are praying right now, I just, I just want to look out and, and make connection with you. Could you just raise your hand if God is saying that he, he wants to bring you back? He's saying, where are you right now to you? And you want to respond to him right now. Amen. Amen. Anyone else? Amen. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, I see. I see. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Let's say this prayer together. Can we repeat this together? Dear Jesus Christ, Savior of the world, I have sinned. I am dead. I am guilty. And now I ask for your forgiveness. I ask that the grace of God would cleanse me from all my unrighteousness. And instead of being a child of wrath, that I would be able to be your adopted child. I give you my life. Thank you for forgiving my sins. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let the God keep speaking to you about this, church. God has something more to do in your hearts, all right? If you raised your hand and you want more prayer, please come forward and we'll pray for you. God bless you. Have a great day. Hey, I'm Murph, and we really hope that you enjoyed this week's Adventure TV broadcast. We here at The Adventure have two main goals, to love God and to love people. And we hope that you felt that through this week's broadcast. If you would like to join us on Sunday mornings, we have services at 9 and 11, and also on adventurehome.org. Thank you again, and God bless. All creation worships you. All we never can.